joining uh, this online session of the um, Oxford Jurisprudence Discussion Group. This is the only uh, online session we'll have this term. This is the fourth session of this term. And um, today we have with us Professor Mark Greenberg. Um, professor Mark Greenberg is a professor of law and philosophy at the law faculty of UCLA. And you probably know him for the many papers that he has published on uh, legal philosophy, especially perhaps uh, How Facts Make Law in 2004, The Standard Picture and Its Discontents in 2011, and The Moral Impact Theory of Law in 2014. Today, he's going to present the paper titled, How Can We Know the Law? A Case Study in Non-Basic Epistemology. Um, so Professor Greenberg will talk for around 30 to 40 minutes, and then the usual Q&A will proceed. And uh, as usual, for the Q&A, you, you will need to um, raise your hand on Zoom or write Q on the chat, and we'll put you in the queue for questions. Professor Greenberg, thank you very much, very much for coming to the Oxford JDG online, and the floor is yours. Well, thanks very much uh, for that introduction, and, and and thanks to all of you for for joining. It's always great to be back in Oxford, even even if only virtually. Uh, Oxford's a place where I have many uh, fond memories. So the the paper today uh, is supposed to introduce a topic that I call non basic epistemology. The, the main goal in the paper is to introduce the topic and elucidate this central notion of tracking. Uh, I, I take the legal domain as a case study, and I'm gonna argue for the thesis that the epistemology of law has to track in the sense that I'm gonna elucidate the metaphysics of law. But I really intend the argument for that particular conclusion to be tentative and, and illustrative. So a little bit of background, some domains are non-basic in the sense that the facts of those domains obtain in virtue of more basic facts. So the mental, the semantic, the legal, and perhaps more controversially, the moral um, are examples of non-basic domains. Microphysics, mathematics, and again, perhaps morality are candidates for basic domains. But it should be obvious that much of our knowledge is of non-basic domains. So my topic concerns the relation between how the facts of the non-basic domains are metaphysically determined and how we can ascertain these facts. Just a terminological point, in order to avoid confusion, I'm going to use determine and its cognates, determination, determining, and so on, exclusively metaphysically. So more specifically, uh, in the paper, I focus on a set of questions about whether an, and under what conditions we need to infer the facts of the domain from the more basic determining facts. There, there are some relatively clear instances of non-inferential access to the facts of a domain. So one's access to one's own mental states and one's perception of the external world are good examples. In these cases, tracking is unnecessary because of our non-inferential access to the target facts. We don't have to infer the target facts from the more basic facts that determine them, at least you know, typically or often in, in those uh, domains. But there are difficult questions about other domains. So in the next section of the paper, uh, I introduce and clarify the basic question, whether epistemology, whether the epistemology of a non-basic domain has to track its metaphysics. And then in the following section, I turn to the legal domain and argue that it's unusual in that its epistemology does indeed track its meta or must indeed track its metaphysics. Okay, so let me explicate the topic a bit. 
So first, the notion of tracking. On a common view, mental facts obtain in virtue of physical facts. Semantic facts are often thought to obtain in virtue of facts about the use of words. And legal facts obtain in virtue of, among other things, facts about whether various people have done and decided various things in the past, and more controversially, in virtue of moral facts. So one, one clarification that I need to make, in, in this paper, when I talk about more basic facts, I mean to refer to facts that are more basic than the relatively high-level target facts under discussion, not to the most basic facts of the universe. The topic that I introduce in the paper concerns how our access to the facts of non-basic domains relates to the metaphysics of those domains. Because the target facts are, by hypothesis, determined by more basic facts, one obvious route to ascertaining the target facts goes via the more basic facts. Indeed, on a straightforward line of thought, one way to ascertain the facts of a non-basic domain just follows willy-nilly from the way in which the facts of that domain are determined. So suppose the X facts are determined by more basic A facts, B facts, and C facts. We could put it schematically, uh, say that the X facts are a particular function F of the A, B, and C facts. In other words, F is a function that maps the A, B, and C facts to the target facts. So on the straightforward line of thought that I'm illustrating here, um, one way to detect, one way to ascertain the X facts is simply to detect the A, B, and C facts, and then to infer the target facts in a way that conforms to the mapping given by F. So here's a very simplistic example. Suppose what makes it the case that one is dreaming is that one's alpha fibers are firing at 30 hertz. So in that case, on the straightforward approach, we can infer from the fact that someone's alpha fibers are firing at 30 hertz that they're dreaming. So let me, let me give a slightly more serious example. So suppose for the sake of argument that HLA Hart's theory of the metaphysics of legal facts is true. So on Hart's theory, roughly speaking, the convergent practices of judges and other officials determine both which legal materials are relevant and exactly how those legal materials together determine the content of the law. So on the straightforward approach that I'm talking about, one would ascertain the legal facts simply by inferring the legal facts from facts about the way in which judges treat legal materials as bearing on the content of the law. So suppose that in the local jurisdiction, judges treat the semantic content of statutes as constituting legal norms. By the semantic content, I mean uh, roughly the, the literal uh, meaning of the words. So in that case, we would infer from this practice of judges and from the fact that there's a statute with the semantic content that the sale of marijuana is prohibited to the conclusion that there's a legal prohibition, there's a legal norm prohibiting the sale of marijuana. So we need to distinguish at least three possible understandings of tracking. So first, there's what I will call the trivial understanding. Given that the facts of any non-basic domain are determined by more basic facts, there's a sense in which any method that accurately identifies the non-basic facts is just ipso facto tracking the determining facts. So this sense of tracking is trivial because in this sense, to track the determining facts is just to ascertain the target facts. So I won't, I won't be talking about the trivial understanding. On the second understanding of tracking, for a method of ascertaining the target facts to track the metaphysics of the domain is for the method to involve inferring the target facts from the more basic facts. 
On this second understanding, however, the method of ascertaining the target facts need not make reference to the more basic facts under that description or as such. In other words, one who employs the method need not think of the more basic facts qua more basic determining facts. Indeed, one can use the method without even having the concepts necessary to think of the more basic facts in this way, such as the concept of metaphysically more basic. The third understanding of tracking, which I'll call strong tracking, differs from the second precisely in that it requires that the method of determining the, sorry, the method of ascertaining, I need to be consistent with, with what I said about my terminology, the method of ascertaining the target facts involves inferring the target facts from the determining facts under that description. So the second and third notions of tracking are the interesting ones. My general question about when and to what extent the epistemology of a non-basic domain must track its metaphysics could be asked with respect to either the second or third notion. My focus will primarily be on the second notion. When I use the term tracking without qualification, I, I intend the, the second notion. There's at least one point in the discussion, however, where, where my argument touches on the stronger thesis that the inferences must involve strong tracking. Okay, so let's distinguish between, on the one hand, inferences from some of the more basic determining facts to the target facts, and on the other hand, an inference from all of the more basic determining facts to the target facts. Let's call the former partial tracking and the latter full tracking. So that's, that's the, the final kind of distinction I need uh, just to set things up. So, so now I, I want to uh, turn to the, the question of whether tracking is necessary, and it's gonna vary from domain to domain. So I, I take it that tracking is a good method of ascertaining the facts of a non-basic domain when it's feasible. But, but the real question is, or at least my question now is, must the epistemology of a non-basic domain track its metaphysics? And for each non-basic domain, as I said, one can ask whether and to what extent its epistemology has to track its metaphysics. Further, there's the question, what is it about a domain and our relation to it that has the consequence that its epistemology must track its, its metaphysics? So what, one preliminary clarification that, that I wanna illustrate with the legal domain. Of course, there's a way of finding out what the law is that doesn't involve inferring it from the more basic determining facts. It doesn't in involve tracking. One can ask an expert or look it up on the internet, but these testimonial sources of knowledge can't be the primary method of discovering legal facts. An expert has to figure out what the law is in order to be able to tell you and ultimately the expert needs a way of finding out what the law is that doesn't rely on the testimony of other experts. In other words, finding out what the law is by asking an expert is parasitic on a primary method of ascertaining the content of the law. So in general, the thesis that we're interested in here is that the primary method of ascertaining the facts of a domain has to involve tracking primary as opposed to parasitic in the sense that I just elaborated. So what are the alternatives to tracking? So let's distinguish two broad categories of alternatives. First, we have domains in which we have reliable non-inferential knowledge of the facts of the domain. So let's call these cases of direct as opposed to inferential knowledge. Second, we have domains in which our knowledge is inferential, but the relevant inferences are not inferences from more basic determining facts, but from facts of some other sort. So the idea here is that we could infer the target facts from mere evidence, evidence that doesn't bear a constitutive relation to the target facts. So I'll call these kinds of cases, cases of lateral knowledge.
I mentioned before the idea of partial tracking as opposed to uh, full tracking. I'm not going to kind of consider that an alternative uh, to tracking, but rather a, a, a species uh, of tracking. So there could be domains in which our, our knowledge is based on an inference from a proper subset of more basic determining facts, possibly other facts as well uh, to the target facts. So one, one final qualification, uh, it's important to, to notice that in order for a method to be a genuine alternative to tracking, the method must not be parasitic on tracking. So for example, it mustn't be that we first infer the target facts from the more basic determining facts, and then use this knowledge of the target facts to validate a putative alternative method. Because in that case, the putative alternative method would be parasitic on, on tracking. So in the paper, I discuss various possible examples of each category. I'm going to skip the examples now uh, so that I can get to the case study uh, of the legal domain. All right, so the, so the legal domain. So I'm going to take the legal domain to comprise facts about the content of the law. Legal, con sorry, legal facts. Uh, for short, such as the fact that it's not permissible to compel a person to give self-incriminating testimony uh, in the United States. Now, of course, some people don't think there are any legal facts uh, in this sense. Um, obviously, someone who doesn't think there are legal facts um, won't be interested in this paper. Um, that's fine. I'm not, I'm not uh, arguing uh, with them here. I'm just taking um, for granted that there are uh, legal facts um, in my sense. Legal facts are not at least for the most part, among the most basic uh, facts of the universe. Rather, they obtain in virtue of other more basic facts. I use the term theory of law in a technical sense for an account of what the more basic facts are and how they determine the content of the law. And in the paper, I sketch three different competing views of the metaphysics of law, just so that people have some sense of the territory, Many of you are, are familiar with, with examples of, of such theories. I'm going to skip that now. Um, another bit of terminology is that I use the term legal interpretation for the process of ascertaining legal facts. So, so uh, a theory of law, in my terminology, again, is a, an account of how the more basic facts determine the legal facts, but, uh, but legal interpretation uh, is the process of ascertaining the legal facts. It's epistemic. And the central thesis of my argument um, concerning the legal domain is that our, our only reliable method of finding out about legal facts, um, in fact, uh, I, I want to say um, our only uh, method of obtaining knowledge of legal facts is through the metaphysically more basic facts that determine the legal facts. So more carefully, the reliability of a method depends on the extent to which it tracks the metaphysics, because of course, methods could track the metaphysics to a lesser or greater extent. So to the extent that a method diverges from tracking, it can only yield incomplete knowledge. For example, knowledge of a limited body of legal facts, such as those of a, legal ju of a local jurisdiction. So I'm gonna agree that yes, there could be a local jurisdiction where there's a method that um, diverges um, to some extent from tracking, but, it, but, but such a method, um, I'll say, can, can only yield incomplete knowledge, such as, such as uh, knowledge um, of the legal facts in that local jurisdiction. I'll, we'll, I'll, I'll have examples. We'll, we'll talk more about this, I'm sure, in discussion. So, a few just preliminary remarks about why the legal domain seems like unpromising territory in which to seek an alternative to tracking. So one notable thing about many domains where tracking is not necessary is that there's a method that's widely accepted to be reliable in those domains. So perception of the external world is a good example. In the case of law, however, far from there being a method of legal interpretation that's widely agreed to be reliable, there's widespread debate 
over the correct method of legal interpretation. Competing methods of legal interpretation take inconsistent positions about diverse factors. So that's the first reason. Second, there's a great deal of disagreement about the legal facts themselves, in part because of the disagreement about methods. And though there are many legal facts, of course, on which there is consensus, many of the competing methods of legal interpretation yield all or nearly all of these legal facts, the consensus ones. And it's therefore problematic to try to validate a method by showing that the method yields more of the legal facts on which there's consensus than any other method. More fundamentally, the consensus about many legal facts is likely the result of partial tracking. All of the leading methods of legal interpretation involve inferring legal facts from facts that are strong candidates to be among the determining facts. Moreover, the leading methods agree about the importance of certain basic determinants of legal norms, not qua basic determinants, of course. They don't, methods of legal interpretation don't generally think in terms of concepts like metaphysics. Um, but, but as I say, the, legal the leading methods of legal interpretation agree about the importance of certain basic determinants, such as the meanings of certain texts or utterances. In other words, leading methods of legal interpretation all partially track the determining facts. And when the determining facts on which the leading methods of interpretation converge, all push in the same direction, and nothing else pushes in a different direction, we get a consensus about what the legal facts are. Now, if, if this suggestion is right, then an attempt to validate a method by appeal to legal facts on which there's a consensus won't avoid dependence on, pra on tracking because the legal facts on which there's consensus themselves um, are the product of tracking. I should, that, that I'm speaking very loosely when I say the product of. Our knowledge of those consensus legal facts is the product of tracking. So in sum, we lack an independent way of validating a candidate method of ascertaining legal facts. If someone comes along and says, oh, here's a method that doesn't involve tracking, how are we going to validate such a method? Without some way of checking whether the deliverances of a method are correct, we can't use a kind of induction to move from the fact that a method has yielded the right answers so far to the conclusion that its answers to new questions are correct. The, the concern that I'm pointing to now is that in other areas, we can hypothesize that a particular kind of inductive inference is reliable. So there's a, someone, someone says, well, here's a method, seems to work pretty well so far. And then we can see whether the method bumps up against reality, whether it yields false predictions. But in the legal case, it's hard to see how we, we can ever get such a reality check since we don't seem to have an in, independent purchase on the legal facts. So this situation raises a more general worry. Even if a certain non-tracking method, and in the discussion, if, if you're interested, I'll, I'll, I'll suggest what such a method could be. Even if a certain non-tracking method happens to be reliable, there would be a serious question about how it could be justified to rely on it. How could it be justified to rely on the method in the face of pervasive disagreement about which method is correct and no independent way of validating the method? The situation is not like one in which a creature has a reliable method like perception of the external world, that it has no choice but to rely on, despite having no independent access to the reliability of the method. Here, there's a choice to rely on one method rather than competing methods without any basis for believing that the method is more reliable. So 
a related point is that the truth of beliefs formed through the method seems merely lucky. So if we do have a method that happens to be reliable and we start using it, it just seems lucky that the beliefs that we form in that way are true, despite the fact that the method is in fact reliable, because the choice of this method over others is merely lucky. So these considerations about justification point towards the claim, not merely that a method has to track the determining facts, but it, that, that it must track them as such. Because the argument applies to any method, no matter how reliable, unless the method can be independently validated. And the argument purports to show that in the circumstances, the only way of validating a method would be to show that it tracks the determining facts. So I'm gonna, for the most part, set aside these issues in the paper, uh, focusing instead on issues about reliability. Um, but that's the direction in which um, I'm thinking um, of developing the, the argument. So in the paper, I, the next thing I do is, is some specific exploration of possible alternatives to tracking in the legal domain. In other words, potential counterexamples. Um, but I'm gonna be very brief uh, now. Um, the, the possibility of direct, in other words, non-inferential knowledge of the legal facts just seems wild. It seems obvious to me that the primary route to legal facts in the sense of primary explicated before is via inference from among other things, facts about what various texts mean and what various people have done or decided. In the, in the case of legal facts, we just don't have anything analogous to perception of the external world um, or first person access to our own mental states or a priori knowledge of fundamental moral principles. There's just nothing analogous here. But I wanna say a little bit more than, than that. But I wanna make things a little more uh, challenging for myself. So if we can reach a conclusion by explicit inferential reasoning, presumably the reasoning can become automated. Think about chess masters. So they can look at a chessboard and reach a conclusion without being explicitly expressly aware of the premises or of the inferential route. And I don't want my thesis about the legal domain to be merely a claim about what abilities humans now happen to have. So I need the notion of tracking to include some kind of tacit inference. Now this might be thought to raise a worry about my way of elucidating tracking by contrasting it with non-inferential methods, such as perception um, or first-person access to the mental. My quick answer, we can say more about it later, my quick answer is that though perception probably does involve some tacit inferences, think for example of the processes involved in depth perception, vi visual depth perception, it doesn't involve tacit inferences from the more basic determining facts. So in particular, perception doesn't begin from premises about microphysical facts, say. Now, lateral not, so that's direct knowledge of legal facts. I've said a little bit about that. What about lateral knowledge of legal facts? It also seems problematic. There would have to be a domain in which the facts, call them the X facts, are correlated with legal facts in a, in a law-like way, but not because the X facts are determinants of the legal facts. Because if they were determinants of the legal facts, then, then going via the X facts would be a form of tracking. In the paper, I talk about the possibility of lateral knowledge at greater length. Uh, right now, I just wanna make one particularly important point about the possibility of, in, um, of, of, of lateral knowledge. Um, the possibility of inferring legal facts from their effects faces a special obstacle. So in many areas, we, we, can, we can learn about the target facts um, from their effects. But the phenomena, so, so just for example, the phenomena that are studied by 
physics and the special sciences are embedded in causal networks. As a result, there are indefinitely many ways of finding out about these phenomena. By contrast, legal facts seem to have their principal causal impact through only one pathway, people's beliefs about the legal facts. So for example, the fact that the law prohibits insider trading affects behavior mainly by way of people's beliefs that the law does so. Now, it's an interesting question why the effects of legal norms are mediated primarily by our beliefs. It's not in general true that the effects of non-basic facts are mediated primarily by our beliefs, obviously. Maybe the answer is that normative facts are special in this respect, that they, that normative facts have their causal impact via humans' beliefs about them. I talk more about this a bit in the paper. But the bottom line is that because the effects of legal facts are mediated primarily by our beliefs about them, the effects of legal facts don't provide us with a primary way of ascertaining the legal facts. So unlike ordinary empirical phenomena, the effects of legal norms don't give us an independent route to finding out about these norms because the effects are themselves dependent on people's having formed beliefs about the norms. So in the paper, as you know, I respond to several objections, including some that appeal to the possibility of gaining legal knowledge through inferences with the wrong kind of structure, in particular inferences based on only some of the determining facts, rather than rehearsing my responses to, to objections. Now I'll, I'll wait to see what, what people want to talk about. Um, just to, to conclude, um, let, me, let me pull together some of the distinctive features of the legal domain that I'm hypothesizing or speculating um, make the tracking thesis plausible uh, in that domain. So there's the fact that that legal facts have their causal impact only or principally via people's beliefs about these facts. There's the absence of any plausible analog of perception or anything like uh, a priori knowledge of moral or mathematical facts. There's the existence of pervasive disagreement over both the first order facts and methods of ascertaining them. Um, and there's also a point that I didn't mention uh, now, but I talk about in the paper, um, which is that examples don't play an important role in the meta semantics of legal facts uh, in the way that they do in some domains. Finally, I, and I say this, I think in the paper as well, Probably there, there are certain assumptions that I'm making um, about what the metaphysics of legal facts are is like um, that are playing a role. So in other words, um, I, although I'm not assuming any particular theory of the metaphysics of legal facts, I do um, have some um, basic um, ideas about what the, the metaphysics of legal facts are like. Um, that uh, are, are playing a role in, in, the, in the plausibility considerations. So one final thought, what are some domains other than law where it might be worth exploring the necessity of tracking? So maybe normative domains like etiquette, religion, and games uh, would be candidates. Another, another related thought, maybe domains in which the facts are grounded in conventions, uh, such as economics. So I'll, 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 I'll leave you with that. Um, thanks very much for listening. Great, thank you very much, uh, Professor Greenberg for that. Uh, we